Hello, and welcome to this video series covering Sitecore and Docker. My name's Rob Earlham, and I'm a technical evangelist with Sitecore, and I'm going to kick this series off with a short introduction to what Docker is and why you might want to use it. Have you ever had issues getting a new project set up on your machine with all the required dependencies? How about managing those dependencies throughout all of your non-production and production environments? What happens when you need to upgrade one or more of those dependencies? Have you ever mistakenly developed against one version of a dependency only to discover a different version is live in production? Also, what about teams who have developers who want to run different operating systems? Maybe you have some back-end C-sharp developers wanting to run Windows, and you have some front-end developers wanting to work on Macs. The problem here is that you're deploying just the application on its own and relying on the host environment to provide all the dependencies. In reality, the environment should be responsible for the OS and not much else. What all these problems are talking about are issues of consistency, isolation, and reproducibility. These are problems that Docker and containers in general were created to solve. When you deploy a container, you obviously deploy your application inside of it. But that's not all. You also package up all of the dependencies and libraries the application needs, all of its configuration, and any other requirements that the application has to run. Now this may sound a little bit like a virtual machine, but there's some crucial differences between how virtual machines run and how containers run. When working with a virtual machine, you have your host infrastructure, and on there you have your installed host operating system. You then have a hypervisor, which provides your virtualization functionality. You then install your virtual machines. Each one of those has its own guest operating system, and then you finally get to set up the application you want to run. And you may have multiple virtual machines running on your host infrastructure. The issue with this configuration is the green boxes you can see here. They represent four entire operating systems. And that can be really demanding on the system resources and disk space available from your host. Docker and containers approach this in a different manner. You still have your host infrastructure and you still have your host operating system. However, instead of going through a hypervisor, we now have the Docker daemon. The Docker daemon allows you to leverage the kernel from the host operating system and the host operating system resources, allowing you to run much more lightweight containers directly on the host, meaning you can run far more containers on a host infrastructure than you can full virtual machines. But where do these containers come from? Well, a container is built from an image, and an image is created in layers. If we look at this example of a Sitecore XP image, the first layer we build on is the .NET 4.8 Windows Server Core Long-Term Support 2019 image. This is an image provided by Microsoft. We pull that image down from the Docker registry, and we then add our own layer on top, which includes all of the XP functionality. This may be an image for a CM or a CD, but they're all built in the same manner. We can then use this XP image to build on top of again. Let's say we want a Sitecore image which contains PowerShell extensions as well. We would have the same Windows Server Core base and XP layers we created before, but then we'd add another layer to install Sitecore PowerShell extensions. The same happens when you think about SXA. Again, we'd have the same three layers we created for PowerShell extensions image, but then we create another layer on top containing all of the SXA data. The great thing about this concept of layers is that they're shared between the images. So that Windows Server Core layer is only downloaded to your machine once. When we create our custom XP layer that sits on top of it, it's only created once, despite the fact that all three of these images use it. So we talked a little bit about creating images there, but where do we pull down the pre-built ones from? Well, they generally come from registries. The most popular public registry is the Docker Hub, and that has images for almost every application you can think of. You then have your host machine and you install the Docker daemon mentioned previously. You can then use the Docker CLI to issue commands to the Docker daemon that will pull these images down and store them in your local registry. Docker is based off this distributed storage model in much the same way how Git is used for your source code. So we could pull down a Redis image, we could pull down a .NET Core image, and then they're stored in our local registry 
ready for us to use. But once we've downloaded them, how do we create containers from them? Well, as we said, we have our Docker Hub, we have our daemon in our registry. We could pull down these public images from Docker Hub, and then we can use different commands in the Docker daemon to create containers based on them. And we can create as many containers as we have resources available in the system. We can also take those images and add our own custom layers on there to create custom images that we've created. We can then take those custom images and build different containers based on those. So you can see how the layered approach allows you to leverage the functionality others have created to make it really simple to build out your containers. Another concept I want to touch on is the concept of volumes. If we look at the same example, we've created a custom image based on the .NET Core framework. We can create containers based on that image. If I make a change to the .NET code, that's a compiled language. So I'll have to rebuild that image and redeploy the container. But what if I'm just making changes to static files? If I'm just changing HTML or CSS, I don't want to go through that overhead of that build process. And that's where the concept of volumes comes in. Volumes allow you to have a folder on your host machine appear as a shared folder within the container. And this is really powerful. It means that you can then use your favorite IDE to directly interact with the files on your host system. And those changes are instantly reflected in the container, meaning you keep that rich developer workflow you're used to. The last key concept for containers I want to touch on is the concept of networking. A lot of the times when you create your containers based on your images, you're going to need more than one container to create a full holistic system. Say for example, our .NET Core application has a SQL Server backend storing our data. Well, you can download a SQL Server image, again from Docker Hub, freely available from Microsoft. You can then create a container based on that image. And Docker has the functionality to create networking connections between these containers. So we can create a network that allows our .NET Core container to communicate with our SQL Server container. Let's take a look at some of this in action. Okay, so I've opened up a PowerShell window here, and I'm gonna to start to use the Docker command line interface, or CLI, to interact with the Docker daemon on my host machine, and I'm gonna issue it various different commands. We're gonna start off with a Docker pull command, and that's gonna tell the daemon to pull down an image from a public registry. In this case, it's gonna pull down a sample.NET Core image, the image that's been tagged with the .NET Core app tag. Here you can see it's executing six different pull requests, and each of these represent a different layer within the image. Okay, that's completed. So now we have that image available on my local registry. But I'm gonna issue a slightly different pull command this time. This time it's gonna to go to the same registry, but it's gonna use a different tag. And this is a slightly different sample image that Microsoft provide, this time with some ASP.NET functionality. And the interesting thing here is you'll see that the four first layers in the image say that they already exist. And you can see the IDs match the IDs for the layers above. So as we said before, the layers are shared between different images. So it doesn't need to pull those down again. So now they both exist in our local registry, we can check that. We can use a Docker image list command and that'll tell me all the images that I have installed locally. We can see they come from the same repository. They have the two different tag names, we have the ID of the image, when it was built by Microsoft, and the size on disk. The next thing I can do now I have those images is to start to create containers out of them. The first one I'm gonna use is the .NET app tagged version, which we downloaded first. This is a simple console application, which is gonna output some hello world text. As soon as we run it, it'll complete its workload and the container will exit. We can use the docker ps-a command and that'll list all the containers on my machine. And here we can see it. We can see the generated container ID, the registry and the tag for the image that was used to build it, when it was created, its current status and the fact it completed its workload and exited, and some other properties as well. Next, I want to run the other image we downloaded, the ASP.NET one. This time I'm gonna pass a few more parameters in. We again use the docker run command, but now we're gonna pass in the dash D flag. And that means it's going to run in disconnected mode. That means that this PowerShell window won't be connected to the container, so it'll run as a background process. We also pass the dash P flag, and that is going to allow us to map some ports from my host machine 
to the port internally from the container. In this case, we're going to map port 8000 on my host to wire through to port 80 inside the container. Finally, we pass in the name of the registry and the tag again. Because this is running in disconnected mode, all we get back is the ID. But if we once more run docker ps-a, we can see we now have this new container here. We also see the port mapping listed as well. So I'm going to go and hit the site. And here we can see the output of that container. It's some pretty simple environment data about how the container itself is running. Now I've jumped back to PowerShell and I just want to tidy up my containers before I finish. So we can see we have our exited container. So we're going to tidy up that one first. I'm going to use the docker rm or remove command. And one of the nice things about docker is you only need to pass enough of the ID to uniquely identify an object to be able to work with it. So in this case, there's only one container which starts with an ID of eight. So I only need to pass that in and I can tell Docker to remove that container. Next, I want to tidy up the second one we created. Again, we use the docker rm command, but as that container is running, I'm going to have to use the force flag because it's going to tell it to stop it first. Again, we provide enough of the container ID for it to be uniquely identified. In this case, just a one. And now if we once more run docker ps-a, we can see we don't have any containers active in the system. The final piece of functionality that I want to show you here is called Docker Compose. And for that, I'm gonna jump over to VS Code. Docker Compose allows you to specify how you instantiate your containers with all the various different properties in a YAML configuration file. If we take a look at this Docker Compose YAML file, you can see we start off by specifying the version of Docker Compose. Then the services elements underneath each represent an individual container. We start off with our ASP.NET container, and we're going to specify the image and the tag we used before. We then specify the same port mapping. And the advantage to doing this through configuration instead of directly on the command line is that you can then version control this file. So any changes to how these containers get instantiated is stored in your version control system. So I'm just going to go straight down to the PowerShell terminal below. And to stand up a container through Docker Compose is really simple. All you have to type is Docker Compose up, and I'm going to use the disconnected flag again to run this as a background process. That's then going to go away, and it's going to start up the same container I created before. We can again run Docker PSA, and it'll show us the same containers running just as it was previously. Another great example of running things through Docker Compose is the fact that if you have a system which requires more than one container, and Sitecore is a fantastic example of this, as you'll see in future videos. You can specify multiple services within a Docker Compose file, and you can stand them all up with a single Docker Compose up command. To remove them afterwards is just as easy. All you have to do is call Docker Compose down. That will then go and remove all of the containers that are specified in this Docker Compose file. Hopefully that's given you a good introduction to what Docker is. We've covered some of the problems that Docker and containers tries to solve. We've looked at the differences between a VM and a container. And we've also looked at the concepts of layers, registries, images, containers, networking, and volumes. Next up in this series, we're going to be taking a look at the Sitecore Docker Images repo for how you can get started working with Sitecore on Docker. If you want further information about Docker, there are some fantastic getting started tutorials available on the Docker site at the URLs you can see here. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to follow the Learn Cycle hashtag for future videos.